In this tutorial, we're going to talk about parameters, parameterization, parametric equations, and domains. We have already talked about the grasshopper parameter objects, which you can find in the component palettes under params, and we have used some of these already. So parameters determine certain characteristics, properties, or behavior of a system or a member in a system. And in very basic terms, to parameterize means to express something in terms of parameters. To illustrate it, here I have a preview swatch color expressed in RGB values. These parameters have domains from 0 to 255, so we express the swatch color as a mixture in different proportions of shades red, green and blue. And I also have an option for transparency. Another example could be a point constructed by defining x, y and z coordinates. I'm using number sliders to input values with bounds from 1 to 10. Here is an example of a parametric equation used to define coordinates for points. I'm using trigonometric functions here. The input values are degrees in radians. And you could also imagine us connecting these points and creating a closed curve, a circle. Parameterization in general is quite a broad concept, so we are going to look at it through the relevant lens, but it's most useful for mapping values. Here I have our previous exercise as an example. We are using bounds and construct domain components to define the numeric domain, but the mapping happens inside the gradient which associates each numeric value from a given set with color values from the target set. The mesh vertex Z coordinates belong to the source domain and the gradient colors from green to red are the target domain. And of course, we can easily flip the order here, creating a reverse relationship. There are other components in Grasshopper that act similarly to the gradient, meaning they are used for mapping, remapping values. So let's create another scenario to explore number remapping. Let's go under Mesh, Primitive, and choose Mesh Plane. This component has three inputs, a possibility to define a rectangular boundary, the width, which is the number of mesh faces along the x-axis, and the height count, which is the number of faces along the y-axis. There are two outputs, the Mesh Plane as geometry and the area of the plane. I'd like to change the number of faces to increase the resolution of this mesh. I'm going to use a panel for that and type in 20. So my preliminary plan is to take the mesh vertices and then move them along the z-axis, move them up. And after that, I want to create a new mesh from these transformed vertices. I'm going to use the construct mesh component for that. As I drop the construct mesh component onto canvas, you can see the default geometry in the Rhino viewport. So I'm going to turn off this preview. Now let's create a rule for transforming the vertices. I'm going to keep it simple and use an attractor point, something that we have already done before. Under params geometry, I'm going to pick a point container, right click on it and choose to set one point. If you don't see the gumball when the point container is selected, you need to go to the Grasshopper's main menu bar under Display and turn on the gumball preview. To make the attractor point more prominent, I'm going to use dot display and this time define all the parameter values inside the capsule by right-clicking on each input. So the next step is to evaluate distances between the attractor point and the mesh vertices. Under Vector, Point, we have previously used the Distance component, but in this exercise we're going to use the Pull Point component. Again, under Vector, Point, Pull Point. The main difference between these two components is that the Distance component requires two sets of points to measure the distance, while the Pull Point component takes other types of geometry as well. So pull point component has a default algorithm inside 
to find the second set of points on other types of geometries. I'm not going to talk in depth about it in this video, but we are going to revisit pull point in the following tutorials. In this instance, we still use a point as a geometry that pulls, and the points to search from are the vertices. I'm going to delete the distance component. So we get the distances. Let's also go under Math, Domain, and grab the bounds to see the minimum and the maximum distance values. So next, I want to generate a list of Z magnitude values that are proportional to these distances, but within a different domain. To do that, I'm going to use the Remap Numbers component, which you will find under Math Domain. The Remap Numbers takes a list of numbers, in this instance distances, and applies them to a different numeric domain. So the component needs to evaluate the initial source domain. We can input it as the bounce output. And then to define the target domain, I'm going to use a panel and type in uh, from 0 to 5. The remapped numbers provides two output streams, all remapped values and the clipped remapped values. Let's focus on the first output for now and use these values as magnitudes for the Z vectors. Now it's time to move the copies of vertices along the Z axis, but we are missing one step here, which is the transformation itself. So we need to go back to the component palettes under Transform, Euclidean and choose Move. The move component takes objects to be moved. In our case, these are the initial mesh plane vertices. You can see right away in the Rhino viewport that the vertices have been moved using the default transformation settings. I'm going to turn off the preview here so that we only see the transformed points. We need to change the default settings and input our constructed translation vectors. So let's connect and now we have the transformed points in the first output stream. The second output, output X, gives the transformation data. It could be used to transform other objects using the same translation matrices. But such operations are more advanced and irrelevant here in this exercise. So let's input the points as vertices for the newly constructed mesh. For the mesh to be constructed, we also need to input the order in which these vertices will be connected to form mesh faces. We're going to use the same connection order here, so we're going to take the input from the deconstructed initial mesh. So now we have a mesh reacting to an attractor point. It's time to go back to the remap numbers component and talk about the use of clipped output values. In the current instance, when the input source domain matches the domain of the input numbers, there are no clipped values, and thus both outputs are the same. Let's try to disconnect the current source domain and create a custom domain, something lower than the domain of the input values. I'm going to use a panel for that and type in from 0 to 10 and connect to the source domain input. And also don't forget to use clipped values for transformation and see what mesh do we get. It's a planar mesh plane at Z value 5. If we look at the output, all the values are 5, which equals the end of the target domain, because all the input numbers, the distances, exceed the source domain. Now, if we go and move the attractor point closer to the initial mesh plane, thus making the distances shorter, there will be some overlapping values between the actual domain and our custom source domain. These values will then be remapped, and the rest clipped at the value of 5. So this is the way to limit the effect of the attractor point. The first output still gives us the unclipped values, 
but the remapping proportion has changed due to the custom source domain. I encourage you to play around with different input domain combinations for the remap numbers component and also try assigning multiple objects and other types of geometry such as curves or solids to the pull point component. This is it for this tutorial. If you have any questions or suggestions, don't hesitate to leave a comment below. I will see you in the next video.